Amen. You may be seated. It is so good to see you here on Sunday evening as we gather together and open the Word of God. Find in your Bibles 2 Thessalonians. I'm in a series on Sunday nights. We finished 1 Thessalonians, and just a few weeks ago, we began 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to spend about uh, six weeks in 2 Thessalonians. This is our fourth message, so we're right there in the middle on the home stretch, coming as we study 2 Thessalonians. It's a series I've entitled, The Irresistible Church, a church of irresistible influence. What does it mean? For us, as followers of Jesus Christ, to be a part of a church whose influence is irresistible. What does it mean for us to have an impact in our world, in our community, in our families, and in our nation for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And tonight from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, I want to talk to you about this subject. Stand up, get ready, and hold on. Stand up, get ready, and and hold on. Begin reading with me. Hopefully you have your Bibles. You found the passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. We'll read to the end of the chapter. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Remember tonight, the power is in the perfect word of God. Here, Paul moves from from prophecy to practical Christian living and teaching. If you'll remember last week, as we studied the first section of the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, we see where Paul was talking about specific events and moments that must occur in the end times. And now he moves from prophecy to some fundamental practical teaching telling us how we ought to live as faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also transitions from warning against the lies of the enemy, Satan's lies, and encouraging us in God's truth. And he moves from a position of warning to a position of gratitude and thankfulness. He says we ought always to give Thanks to God for you. He constantly encourages this church. It's easy to see that this church has has a, a, a place, a soft spot in the heart of Paul. And he loves and appreciates their faith and their commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand, as Paul begins to transition, he reminds us how important it is for us to have a balance when it comes to our belief and our understanding of the gospel and what it means to follow Jesus. You see, it's important for us to know that prophecy and the end times and all of these things are significant teachings, but they must be balanced by how we are to live in this moment and this time at this day. I've been to conferences and heard preachers who are much more concerned about what God will do with the Jews one day, and they seem to care more about that than what God wants to do right now through the church. And you and I need to understand it's important for us to study It's important for us to learn theology. It's important for us to dive into the Word and believe and understand and uncover deep truths of theology and all of that. But in the end, if we know all sorts of information, but it doesn't lead to transformation, then we are missing out on what God has for us. And so tonight, we see there's a a transition. We must never permit the study of prophecy or any other specific theology to be an escape from our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ. And so here Paul reminds us that every believer has a responsibility to follow Jesus. And what does that look like? Well, here tonight he challenges us to stand up, get ready, and hold on. Stand up, get ready, and hold on. In 2012, Six Flags opened its first new roller coaster in over a decade. 
It was called the Apocalypse, and it opened in a town near Mitchellville, Maryland. I don't know if any of you have been to Six Flags lately, but there's always something fun to find and ride. This roller coaster, the Apocalypse, is a stand-up roller coaster. You don't sit down. You stand up, and you're buckled in, and you are in rows. There are 28 people, and there are seven rows of four people each. The stand-up roller coaster begins, and it immediately drops you 10 stories. That's the first move. Immediately drops you 10 stories and then twists you through hairpin turns. You go upside down at 55 miles an hour. At its height, it is more than 100 feet tall, and the track is over 2,900 feet. Oh, there's a, a vertical loop. And I tell, all of the, I tell you all of this to ask you, who wants to go with me to ride the roller coaster? Yes. Doesn't it sound great? Doesn't it sound fun? I also began to think as I heard about the apocalypse, all the instructions that they give before the roller coaster takes off. Keep your hands and your feet and all your belongings right there where they're supposed to be. You know, make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. No, no loose clothing, sunglasses, things that might fly out. And I can imagine in my mind as I'm preparing to get on this ride, the, the thought going through my mind might be, stand up, get ready, hold on, right? Stand up, get ready, hold on, because you are in for the ride of your life. Well, the reality is, life can feel to us like a roller coaster from time to time. And I don't mean the thrill of the ride. I mean the ups and downs, the ins and outs, and the highs and the lows. The reality is that life can feel like that from time to time. One minute we're up, the next minute we're down. One minute we're in, the next minute we're out. One minute we're high, the next minute we're low. And sometimes we get sick to our stomach because life continues its twists and its turns. You and I both know that life can feel like that. But Paul gives us a reminder of how we are to stand firm and hold fast to what God has given us. And what does life begin to look like in the midst of the chaos and the confusion? What will be evident in our lives if we are willing to stand up, get ready, and hold on? Well, first of all, God's peace is experienced in our lives. God's peace is experienced in our lives. We see this in verse 13 as well as the last two verses in the chapter, verse 16 and verse 17. When we get in a right relationship with God, when we get right with the Lord, we begin to experience God's peace in our lives. And we begin to understand the reality and the nature of God's peace. We begin to discover that God's peace is not the absence of problems or difficulties or struggles, but God's peace is His presence in the midst of chaos, in the midst of difficulties, and in the midst of struggles. The peace of God does not mean that we will never have heartache or difficulties. It means that we have the confident assurance of our relationship with God in the midst of the problems and difficulties of life. Now I want you to understand, believer, you need to hear that. Because the reality is we think once we trust Christ, we are not supposed to have any more problems. That is an American brand of Christianity that you find nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere will you find Jesus saying, come to me and you'll never have a problem. In fact, he says to his followers, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so the reality is, you and I will face difficulty, hardships, and struggles. Well, here he talks about what it means to have the peace of God. Look at what he says in verse 13. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because he chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. What's he talking about? He's talking about salvation. You cannot have the peace of God until you have peace with God through Jesus Christ and his saving work. He's showing us how God's peace can be experienced in our lives. Here he says you are beloved by the Lord. You are the first fruits of the saved. Another translation says saved from the beginning. God's eternal plan of salvation. They are sanctified by the spirit and belief in truth. All of this represents what it means to be a child of God. What it means to have the peace of God. And what it means to be at peace with God. They had no reason to be fearful or worried. You remember. As we talked about last week. As they looked around, they were deceived and they were discouraged because they believed, because somebody sent them a letter claiming to be Paul, 
they believed that they'd been left behind in the rapture. And they didn't know what else was going to happen, but they felt like God had left them behind. And Paul's writing to them to say, listen, you are beloved by the Lord. You're chosen for salvation. You are the first fruits or saved from the beginning. And you are sanctified by the Spirit. You belong to the Lord. You have not been forgotten. You haven't missed the rapture. You haven't been left out of God's eternal plan. You can't lose your salvation. You are God's loved ones. This is what he's saying. And this is why he goes back to this idea of salvation and sanctification. He's reminding them that in the midst of the chaos and confusion, they can still have the peace of God. This leads to peace, but notice what the Bible says in verse 16 and 17. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us, look at these phrases, eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Do you hear that sense of peace and comfort that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ? May our Lord, he says, give you eternal comfort. Good hope that comes through grace. Comfort your hearts. Establish them in every work and in every word. Paul's prayer is they would experience this hope and comfort that comes only from knowing Jesus. You see, in Christ, we don't have temporary peace and comfort. How does the Bible describe it here? Not temporary peace and comfort, but the eternal peace, the eternal comfort that comes only from the Lord. We have a hope that comes through grace. By the way, if we don't know God's grace, we will never know real hope. Here he says we have hope that comes through grace, good hope, through grace. And as a result, the Bible says, God will comfort our hearts and establish them in every good work and word. The peace that we have from God leads to the peace of God in our lives as we follow Him faithfully. And circle these words in your Bible, in every work and word. In other words, in everything you do, you have the peace and the comfort of God. As you follow the Lord, when you know that you are right with God in terms of salvation, then you know that you experience the peace of God and seek to bring Him glory through every work and every word, in every thought and in every deed, in everything you say and in everything you do. Now there's an important, important word here in verse 17 that I want you to circle and underline. The Bible says it would comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Establish is the word I want you to notice. Establish. I want you to circle that word. I want you to highlight it or underline it in your Bible. Because here Paul is talking about what it means to stand firm in your faith so that you are not easily shaken, so that you are not easily moved. It is God who establishes us, but I want you to understand, God uses people to help us get established in our faith. A great need for churches is that those who come to Christ would be established in their faith. That they would stand firm, that they would be bold and faithful, that they would grow deep roots, that, that they would be established and strong in their faith. We need Christians who will take the time to help other Christians be established, to grow deep in their faith. Listen to me. It's important that you come to public worship, to corporate worship. Man, that's important. It's important that you're a part of a life group, faithful and consistently. But it's also important that others are pouring into you and you are pouring into others. That you've been discipled and you're discipling others. This is the way the church grows deep and strong and wide and out at the same time. So that we are established in our faith, Paul encourages the Thessalonian believers on a one-on-one -on -one basis that we ought to be established in every good work and word. Can I ask you a question? Whose heart has been established in the faith because of your influence and your encouragement? Who have you discipled, intentionally brought someone else along in the faith so that they might grow and be established? 
Who discipled you? Can you look back at moments and times of your life and see how God poured into you and now he's calling you to pour into others? Who's established in the faith as a result of your faithfulness and your commitment? As we grow in our faith, we experience the peace of God that comes through salvation. Not only is God's peace experienced in our lives, God's purpose is expressed for our lives. We see this in verse 14. We see the purpose of God. Paul's talking about the peace that we can have through salvation. And in the preceding verses, he uses some very important theological words. And I don't want us to miss those words. He uses the word chose, saved, sanctification, belief. And here in verse 14, he uses a very important word called All of these go together. It reminds me of Romans chapter 8 toward the end of the chapter when he says, Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. And here we see something very similar. We're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We're sanctified. We're saved. We're established. We have belief. And we are called. This represents the purpose that God has for us. In order for God to fulfill his eternal plan, he wants to use folks like me and you to accomplish that plan. Now, I don't want you to miss what's happening here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, you're beloved by God. God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. That's verse 13. Verse 14, to this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how salvation, verse 13, leads to then God's purpose being experienced in your life. Don't get confused or caught off guard. Don't don't be shaken by Bible words. Because a lot of people have taken Bible words and they started to to put them in man-made categories, right? And so we can say that the word election is a Bible word, all right? We can say the word sovereignty is a Bible word, chose, it's a Bible word, but it doesn't necessarily lead us down the road to some man-made category. You see, the Bible says that we are chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. And the Bible says, whosoever will may come. The Bible says that we are a part of God's eternal plan. But the Bible also says that we have responsibility to respond to God's call of salvation in faith and repentance. The Bible consistently affirms God's sovereignty. That just means that He's King of all. He's in charge. That His providence rules over the nations and the world and history and time. But it also constantly affirms man's responsibility that you and I are called to respond to the God gospel of Jesus Christ, and if we don't respond, we are held responsible. Now what does it say? God chose you as the first fruits of salvation. He wanted to see you saved. And then God uses people like Paul and Silas and Timothy to go to Thessalonica and to begin to preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And did everybody respond? No. Everybody didn't respond. God knew exactly who would respond. And those who God knew would respond, did respond in faith and repentance, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so, let me just say this. I think sometimes we get caught up in the reality that salvation is a mystery. I want you to listen. Salvation is a mystery. We will never be able to understand it all, this side of heaven. It's never going to fit into five neat points. It doesn't work that way. Salvation is a mystery, but listen, we get caught up arguing the mysteries of salvation that very often we sacrifice the certainties of salvation. While we need to acknowledge there's certain things that are a mystery that only God knows, the certainties are this, Jesus Christ died for you and for all. His sacrifice is sufficient to save anyone to come to faith and repentance. No one can be saved on their own unless the Spirit draws them. But as God speaks and we respond in faith and repentance, we are saved. That's the reality of salvation. And then... We're called. This is the purpose. If we have the peace of God through salvation, then we are called. The Bible tells us in verse 14, circle that word called in your Bible. This he called you so you may obtain the glory 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the gospel realities ultimately lead to this. The goal is what? The goal is not just your salvation. Oh, that's where we like to stop. The goal is not just, I got saved. Man, that's important. And I want you to have a story. I want you to have a testimony. But the goal is not just that he called you. Why? So that you may obtain to the glory of the Lord. So that God receives the glory through your life and through your story. Why did he call? So that God might be glorified. When sinners believe the truth, God saves them. When they believe a lie and reject the truth, they cannot be saved. The Bible says, 2 Thessalonians 2.10, they refused to love the truth and be saved. But I want you to hear me tonight, being neutral is not an option. There's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to salvation. It's important for us to understand God's purpose for our lives. Can I tell you that Christianity answers the question of my purpose better than anything else in this life? You know, everyone on the face of the earth wants to know their purpose. What is my purpose? Why am I here? In fact, Hugh Moorhead, 45 years ago, began a hobby of writing to famous philosophers, famous scientists, famous authors, and he began by asking them this question. What is the purpose of life? Hugh Moorhead is now the Department of Philosophy Chair at Northeastern University in Illinois. And he wrote to some very famous people asking them the purpose of life. Isaac Asimov wrote back, a famous psychiatrist, and said, As far as I can see, there is no purpose to life. Carl Jung, the Austrian psychiatrist, said, I don't know what the meaning or the purpose of life is, but it looks as if there were something meant by it. Arthur Clark said, I'm afraid I have no concrete ideas of the purpose of life. Albert Ellis said, said this, As far as I can tell, life has no special intrinsic meaning or purpose. Wow, that's encouraging, isn't it? Gerald Frank said, in the cosmic scheme, I see neither meaning nor purpose. Edward Gorney, I doubt if there is one. William Gass, there is no meaning to life. Thomas Nagel, I'm afraid the meaning of life still eludes me. With a sense of resignation, Joseph Heller writes, I have no answers to the meaning of life and no longer want to search for any. These are tragic statements of psychologists, authors, psychiatrists, scientists who say, I have no idea what life is about. It's no wonder, listen, it is not a coincidence that the more America moves away from a Judeo-Christian ethic and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that suicide continues to increase. Because the reality is, if all I am is a cosmic accident and there is no God, then there is no great purpose for life. At least someone like Bertrand Russell was was honest. He's a famous English philosopher and a vowed atheist. I appreciate his honesty when he says, unless you assume a God, the question about life's purpose is meaningless. Freud, whom many of you have studied, also an atheist, said the same thing. He said the idea of a purpose stands or falls with your religious system. These psychiatrists and authors and so-called experts are saying something that you and I already know. That there is no purpose apart from understanding that we were created by God. There's no purpose to life. If there is no God, you're a random accident. You're a freak of the evolutionary chain, a complex germ. Admit it. Think about it. If you're not created by God, then what is the significance of life? To live and then to die. But aren't you grateful the Bible tells us here that we have a purpose to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ? The greatest purpose that you can imagine is given to each and every follower. Aren't you thankful that Jesus has given us a purpose? Why have we been called? So that we might obtain to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. To experience God's glory in our lives and to give him glory through our lives. So what do we experience? First of all, God's peace is experienced in our lives. Secondly, God's purpose is expressed for our lives. And then God's power is exhibited through our lives. Once we experience God's peace and begin to understand his purpose, then, then God's power is displayed in and 
through us, through the Holy Spirit of God, through salvation, a trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even more amazing is that now God has a specific power available to those who trust in Him. The power of the Holy Spirit of God that rests and resides in us. Listen to what it says in verse 15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. That's where the title comes from. Get ready. Stand up. Hold on. Stand fast. Stand firm. Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to stand up and to stay strong. Now look at this now. He says, hold to the traditions that you were taught. That phrase, traditions, is very important. It's very interesting. More than just tradition like we think. Tradition, the way we were raised, or church, the way we experience. More than just what we think of when we hear the word tradition, Paul is talking about something very important. It literally means those things that were handed down. And here he refers to the divine revelation of the word of God. And he says that it was handed down not just by letter, but also by spoken word. And so Paul here is affirming that he realizes he is writing to the church under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. One of the greatest proofs for the veracity of the word of God and the inspiration of the Bible comes from what it says about itself. And here, Paul says, don't lose the traditions, those things handed down. The Word of God, whether it was handed down in letter from the apostles or by spoken word through someone like the Apostle Paul. This is the faith which was once and for all handed down for the saints. And so here he says you have a dual responsibility. What are you called to do? It's important. What does he say? He says, so then, stand firm And hold to the traditions you were taught. So, you got to stand strong, you got to stand up, and you got to hold on. Right? So, So, one involves, in some sense, a defensive posture, knowing that the waves of life are going to crash up against you and difficulties and struggles are going to come, and you have to be firmly planted, you have to stand and stay strong, be firm in your faith, and the other is to hold on to that which you've been taught, to that which you know to be true, to that which the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you. Hold to the truth. Don't move away from the truth of the gospel. If we stand firm, then we can hold. Hold, the word means to hold fast, to hold firmly. It means strength. It means might. It means power. We're able to hold on to God's truth, not in a careless way, but in a powerful way. Never let it go. Paul says in 2 Timothy, I've kept the faith. Meaning, I've guarded the treasure of the gospel and I did not let it spoil. I stood firm. I held on. We, we ought to stand up and hold on, knowing that it's our job to preserve the, the precious, sacred nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the next generation. God gives us His power. We experience the power of God through the Holy Spirit. May 2001, Eric Weinmayer accomplished something that only about 150 people do every year. He reached the top of Mount Everest. The thing that made Eric's achievement so unusual is that he was the very first blind person to succeed in scaling the tallest mountain in the world. Could you imagine? Eric was born with a disease called retinoschisis. And by the time he was 13 years old, he was completely blind. Rather than feeling sorry for himself and giving up, he decided that he was going to press on. He decided he was going to make his mark. He was going to focus not on what he couldn't do, but on what he could do. And he went a whole lot farther than almost anyone expected. He wrote a book, an autobiography. It's called Touch the Top of the World, A Blind Man's Journey to Climb Farther Than the Eye Can See. Can I ask you a question? What's your excuse? What's our excuse? For not experiencing the power of God in our lives. We like to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves or make excuses why we can't accomplish something specific that God has called us to do. Listen, we may allow obstacles to stop us. Threat of persecution to deter us. 
Will we be people who stand firm and hold on and press on in the faith? Or will we allow the problems and struggles of this life to get us off track? It would be nice if following God meant that things always work out well and people always like us and everything's always great and everyone always lives happily ever after. But the reality is sometimes doing what's right means overcoming obstacles. It means enduring difficulties and struggles. How can we expect smooth sailing? No problems. They crucified our Lord. We must be willing to step out in faith and experience the power of God in our lives. You see, as we we stand up in faith and hold on to what we've been taught, we begin to experience His peace, His presence, His power, and His purpose that continue to lead and to guide us so that we might accomplish what He has called us to do. None of this happens by accident. It all happens on purpose. It's all a decision ahead of time. Who am I going to be when the struggles come? What am I going to do when opposition arises? How am I going to live in the midst of chaos and confusion around this world? We have a choice to make. Stand up. Get ready. Hold on. And bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ.